I want to put my teaching hat on this morning, and let's begin with Malachi chapter 2. I want to talk to you today about what the Bible says about divorce and remarriage. As I've said the last few weeks that Malachi was a post-exilic prophet. After they had returned from exile, he is crying and he is sharing with them the judgment of God that is coming. God is about to go silent for 400 years until we see one crying in the wilderness like Elijah, John the Baptist. And it is very interesting to me the things the people of Israel were dealing with over 2,500 years ago are the same things we deal with today. God says through Malachi, I've loved you. And the people respond, oh, really? How have you loved us? He says, where is my honor? You've not honored me. You've not honored me through sacrifice. You've not honored me through the praise that I deserve that should come from your lips. You've walked in dishonor. You haven't returned your love to me. And you've brought in these diseased animals. You've brought in the worst of the worst instead of the best of the best when it comes to offerings. You haven't honored the temple. You've broken the covenant of Levi, and today we get into another way that the people of God have broken covenant. It says in verse 10, have we not all one father, not one God who created us? Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another? That word treacherously there in God's language means evil intent. It is to almost wish death or destruction on a per person or a place. So when he says, why do we deal treacherously with one another? By profaning the covenant of the fathers. In other words, not only have you dishonored me with your worship, not only have you dishonored me with your offerings, your relationships don't reflect my goodness or my glory. You're treating your brother and sister with evil intent. You're, you're, you're walking away from the wives of your youth. You're breaking the covenant of marriage. Because if ever you watch someone go from walking with God into serving the devil, it's always a process. And it starts with a critical spirit disconnecting from other Christians, then you begin to hear them say things and do things you never thought you would hear from them or see them do, and then it starts affecting their home life. The marriage breaks down. The kids rebel. It's a process of destruction. He says, why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. He has married the daughter of a foreign God. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this, being awake and aware, yet who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. When it speaks of marrying the daughter of a foreign god here, breaking the covenant of marriage, what that is speaking of is coming into covenant or having a relationship with someone that is not of God. In years past, people would use passages of Scripture like this to promote racism. This has nothing to do with one's skin color. It has everything to do with whose God is of the person from another race. Solomon had many wives, and it was a problem in the kingdom of God. It says in 1 Kings chapter 11 that he married Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. And he had been told by God through the law not to marry 
these foreign women. But he did it anyways. And it brought about a curse to his legacy. Is it because they were foreign? No. Here's what the Word of God says. It says, don't marry them because they will surely, listen to this, turn your hearts after their false gods. So I believe moving from back then into the right now, especially if you look into the New Testament when it tells us to have no fellowship with someone that's unclean or that's not of God, that we need to make sure that we don't marry people who are not of the faith. I believe God can do anything under grace, but if you go into a marriage or a relationship believing that when you marry them or, or you have a covenant with them or you become best friends with them or business partners with them, somebody listen here, that it's okay that they're not of God, that they don't believe the same way you do. Let me tell you something. If they don't have your morals, they don't have your heart, they can't hear from God. If you build a covenant with them, in business, it will cost you. In marriage, it will cost you. In relationships, it will cost you. You have to be careful who you covenant with. Now, as a Christian, we should love everybody. We should serve those in need. But loving people and serving those in need is not the same as forming a covenant with them. Not everybody needs to be your best friend. And some of us feel like everyone has to be our best friend and we have to be in a best friendship or relationship with everyone. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. If you have a few people that are soulmates in your life, you are blessed, my friend. But when it comes to marriage, beginning a marriage outside of God's covenant is a mistake that will continue to pull you down, weigh you down, and create strife in your life forever unless God gets a hold of the other person. You don't have the same convictions. You don't have the same morals. You don't have the same priorities. And then eventually, the enemy gets involved. And what I see more often than not is the person that was a Christian going into this ungodly covenant ends up losing their faith over a period of time. The unchristian ends up wearing out the Christian when it comes to the things of the faith. So we have to be careful not to be in covenant with people who don't believe the way we believe. He goes on to say this. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. In other words, we've talked about this the last few weeks. You're not bringing your best to God. You're bringing your worst. You're bringing diseased animals. You're putting on a religious show when you bring the offering. You're putting on a religious show when you come to church. You're raising your hands, but your heart is far from him. You're singing his songs, but your heart is far from him. You're doing your job in the kingdom of God, but your heart is far from God. And the Lord says, look, I see your tears but I'm not accepting your offering because your heart is far from me. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness. Here we go. Between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you've dealt treacherously. You've treated your wives from your youth treacherously with evil intent, treating them as an unbeliever, disregarding them using every religious excuse you can possibly think of to get rid of them so you can marry someone new. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one? Having a remnant of the Spirit and why one? Here it is. He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit 
and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. Everybody say hate. hate. Say it again. Hate. All right. He hates divorce. For it covers one's garment with violence. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, in what way? Here it is again. They're questioning back. They're talking back to God. In what way have we wearied him? In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Matthew chapter 19, the Pharisees, let's move to the new covenant quickly. The Pharisees come to Jesus testing him as they often did and they say, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And Jesus answered, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Some of you need to read that three or four times. And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate or in some translations, put asunder. I like that one better. Let no man put asunder. C.S. Lewis believed, and I'm at a place in my life where I believe the same thing, that some marriages weren't ordained by God and that we've been holding people accountable for their past divorces when really God never authenticated their previous marriages to begin with. The reason why the divorce rate is the same in the church as it is in the nation is because many people are religious, but they're not saved. And they've entered into the covenant of marriage, unsaved, jaded, broken, hurting, and they've brought all their past shame, guilt, hurt, trauma into their new covenant without laying those things at the feet of Jesus. And because they've done that, God never gave his blessing to the marriage. You see, some folks have had a religious ceremony, but Jesus wasn't present. Some folks have mouthed the sinner's prayer, but Jesus wasn't present. And I believe with all of my heart, we see many people in the kingdom of God, even ministers that have failed and have had divorces, and we like to throw people away. But what if God wasn't ever in that covenant to begin with? Because you, you can't tell me that two sinners who have turned their backs on God and decide to get married are walking under the umbrella and protection of God's sovereignty and his spirit. Because your sin separates you from God. The Bible teaches that. It doesn't mean he doesn't love you, but it separates you from his blessing his favor, his purpose for your life. And if, if people come together in the covenant of marriage and they haven't confessed their sin, in fact, they're making excuses for their sin. They're calling evil good. Then how can God bless that? And no wonder the covenants end in divorce. Because God wasn't consulted at the beginning. And so we've beaten people up for their divorces. Maybe God wasn't in the divorce or the marriage because people need Jesus. And a marriage is not a marriage unless God the Father authenticates it because Jesus paid for it and the Spirit is leading it. And we need to get back to the covenant of marriage. A biblical marriage is intended to be a lifelong, promise-keeping, soul-to-soul bond that unites man and woman in one flesh. A, a godly marriage will not dissolve over meaningless disagreements. You know, petty arguments, control, nonsense. Uh, you can't just 
exchange the person you married over nonsensical matters, housework, silly things. You have to have a strong enough faith that when things get difficult, when the diagnosis comes, when the kids are going through their changes and in rebellion and all things are collapsing and the finances aren't good and there's confusion. In a godly marriage, no matter what happens, there has to be two people that said, I said I do, and come hell or high water, I'm sticking this thing out because I told God that I would. Something happens when we commit. Something happens when our relationships move beyond uh, attraction and connection and the things we agree on and our marriages become about a shared destiny. See, I don't believe a marriage is about love and ooey gooey stuff. I believe a marriage is about a shared destiny. What God has joined together, if God joins something together, there's a purpose for it. If God joins something together, what he joins together will pursue God's kingdom in a singular way, operating as one, one flesh. So what does God join together? That which serves and honors him. So let me give you some principles from this text today. Over 2,500 years ago, you've already repeated after me on the first point. God hates divorce. Because I know some of you listening to my message today, especially those on the outside, will hear some of my content and you will take it out of context and you will accuse me of not holding people accountable for their divorces. Because I know how religious people that like to peek at everything we do think. So... Understand this before we move forward. God hates divorce. He hates it. That hasn't changed. Anytime a covenant is broken, if you commit to your spouse before God and you break that covenant, it breaks God's heart. When you commit to a local church as a covenant where you've had the bread and the wine and you've taken covenant and you break that covenant for an ungodly reason, it breaks God's heart. Whenever you're in a Jonathan and David friendship with someone, you've known them 30 years, you've cried together, you've prayed together, you've served God together, you've worshiped God together, you've been together through so much. And when you break that covenant and you do something ungodly, you're unwilling to make right, and you allow that covenant of 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, you allow that covenant to break over worldly matters, it breaks God's heart. Because God brings about a covenant which is a spiritual and contractual agreement that is finalized by the shedding of blood. It's the word bereath. God brings people together for a unified purpose and a shared destiny. Amen? So when you're in a godly relationship, you too should be moving forward in the kingdom together. It, it, it should bless you. It should bless them. It is a one flesh blessing. So God hates divorce. He says here in our text, verse 15 of Malachi chapter 2, that he absolutely hates it because he made us one. And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. Let none deal treacherously or ungodly with the wife of his youth. Because in the old covenant, especially at this time, women were not treated with honor. Now, many people will use the Old Testament as God approving of the way women or even those in slavery were treated. That is just not so, friend. That is the media taking things out of context. Sometimes in the Old Testament, the Bible is merely reporting on the culture and telling you how to honor God in spite of the culture, which is what we need for today. That was the culture. God didn't approve of that. There are many things in the Old Testament that God didn't do or approve of. That was setting the standard and paving the way because of sin for a Savior. Because sin brought that curse, Jesus bore that curse in the New Testament. So understand, yes, women were not 
treated in high regard in that setting. But I find it prophetic and intuitive that God says through Malachi, in this dark age, listen, the way you're treating women is an abomination. The way you're throwing away your wives from your youth, it's an abomination. It has evil intent. It is demonic. So he is addressing what was happening under his nose, but he's also giving a prophetic picture of what Jesus was going to come shed his blood for. That was a renewal of covenant. Can I get an amen? amen. We no longer have an excuse to hate because Jesus bore that hate on the cross. We no longer have an excuse to treat our mates like an object or to deal with them treacherously. Why? Because Jesus paid the price for all of us to be redeemed and to become one. The law of Moses allowed a man to divorce his wife if, and I quote, she found no favor in his eyes because he has found uncleanliness in her. How many of you know that that's a very broad uh, definition of why a man should get a divorce. Are you with me? So a man or a male or a rabbi or whatever may be able to take that particular law and say, well, I want to get rid of my wife because I don't find favor in her anymore. Maybe she got old. Maybe there was a pretty looking woman down the street. Maybe that's why you don't find favor in her anymore. Are you with me? The law always falls short of grace because the law is up for interpretation and people that know the law will always break the law and they'll always put the law on others while not living by those principles themselves. That's why we needed Jesus. That's why we need grace because even in this Mosaic law here, there's a gray area for men, sinful men and women, to manipulate the standard that God was trying to set. Is everybody with me? Told you I'm teaching today. Women would literally be stoned for adultery or if they lied to their husbands about virginity. They would stone them. A man could divorce his wife, but the woman could not divorce her husband. This was not God's best. 1 Corinthians 7, 39 says, A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. So now let's talk about new covenant grace. So in that day, the women received all the punishment, but then this wild Nazarene comes along and he runs into a situation in John 8 where a woman has been literally caught in adultery. And all the religious leaders of that day, they're ready to give her her punishment according to the law, the religious law. So they're living in that old covenant, but a new covenant Man walks in to the situation and sees them preparing to kill this woman who's been caught in adultery, and Jesus flips everything. They said to test Jesus, should we stone her? The law of Moses says we should. But Jesus stooped down, as you know, and have heard, and he started writing something in the ground. Many people have thrown out ideas as to what that might be. One of my favorite opinions is that he started to write down all the names of the men about the stoner that had slept with her. Because it's real interesting. We all want judgment. We all want penalty and consequences on people who wrong us but man when we make a mistake 
We're saved by grace. And Jesus stoops down and starts to write, and they raised up and were questioning him. And he says, he who is without sin, why don't you throw the first stone? And as you know, one by one they bailed out. And so Jesus flips the script from the law to grace. And we see this woman end up becoming a champion for Christ because of grace. So yes, Jesus hates divorce as Jehovah did. But there is grace for our mistakes. Jesus said to her, neither I condemn you, go and sin no more. See, in our culture, we want to call evil good, and we want to change it to let's don't condemn people and let them keep sinning. That's not what Jesus said. He said, I don't condemn you, I don't judge you, but now you got to get a hold of your life. Because while their anger and hypocrisy was wrong, you still have some stuff that you got to clean up. New Testament passage on divorce. It says in Matthew 5, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So now, it's not the act of adultery. It's the thought of adultery that will convict you. It's when your mind lusts over someone, which means you are just as guilty as a person caught in the act in the eyes of God. What does that mean? What could that possibly mean? That means to my dear religious friend watching this, the next time you stick your nose up at a church for using someone that's been divorced, just remember, based on the words of Jesus, you're just as bad. Because what you've thought about doing is just as bad as what they did. Don't shout me down while I'm preaching good. Because see, that's how Jesus flipped the script. He said, look, it's no longer about these laws that God provided for us to set a standard where people could manipulate and there was a gray area and they could get rid of their wives and treat women horribly and remarry and do all of these things. Now, I'm judging your heart. I'm judging what's in there. So God hates divorce. Number two, God knows the truth. Everybody say the truth. I don't know why Christian people feel like they have to be the judge and jury of every person. God knows the truth. If you are going through a divorce and you are at fault, at least 50% at fault in the divorce, and you are blaming your spouse, and you are using religious verses as a reason to carry out the divorce, I don't know whether or not you are doing that, but God does. It's not my place to chime in on whether it was the husband's fault, the wife's fault. In my experience, it's always both. But it's not my place to judge. But I want to say this as a prophetic word, God knows what's really going on. If you left your wife to commit adultery and chase another woman, God knows. If you left your husband because you fell in love with a guy that you work with, you can bring up everything he's done. You can have every excuse and paint a picture that makes him look bad or that makes her look bad. But God knows the truth. He knows the truth. He knows the nature of your heart. And that's what we have to remember. It's not what the people that go to church with us think. It's not what people in the community think. It's what God thinks. And you need to understand 
that if you have committed your life to a husband or to a wife, you've come into a covenant with someone, you should keep that covenant. You should keep that covenant to honor God. Now, he knows what lies behind the marriage. He knows what lies behind the narrative. Matthew 19, the Pharisees are questioning him again about this. And they said, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any old reason? He answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and brought them together? He goes on in verse 7 to say, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? Is everybody with me? I know y'all like shouting more than teaching, but I want you to get this in your spirit because it's what we believe as a church. Why did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and put the wife away? I love this response. It, it changes the game. It really does. Listen to this. He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. It can be translated, but from the beginning, it was never God's best or his plan for people to divorce. Powerful, powerful. He said he permitted it because the people's hearts were far from him. Haven't I said to you the last few weeks that that's what Malachi the messenger is addressing? He is addressing the fact that the people have turned their hearts away from God in the area of worship. They've turned their hearts away from God in the area of witness. They've turned their hearts away from God from the area of finances. They've turned their hearts away from God in the area of the covenant of marriage and how they treat God's people. Jesus did not change God's standard for marriage. Jesus exposed the hardness of the hearts of the people who were under the law because there was no grace then. There was no spirit then. I believe the spirit was hovering, but they knew not of it. There, there was no redemption other than the sacrifice of of animals, which was a type and shadow to what Jesus would do. So he permitted this. Jesus gives valid reasons for divorce. You need to listen to this. I want to make this public before I get into the teaching here, just about six, seven more minutes. Under no circumstances should you stay in a marriage where you're being abused. Under no circumstances should you stay in a marriage where you are being physically and sexually abused. Does everybody hear that? Under no circumstances should you stay in a marriage where they are committing adultery on you repeatedly and dishonoring you and their own body in that way repeatedly and are unwilling to change. Adultery and abuse. Those are the reasons we find in the Word of God. God speaks to this. And I say to you, Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. You say, for real? For real. For real. That's what the Word of God says. And we'll get into the grace here in a minute. Luke chapter 16 says the same thing. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Again, God knows the truth. This has nothing to do with those who are shady, manipulate, change the narrative, change the story, because everyone who's ever looked on a person with lust is an adulterer. Right? So if Jesus 
If he drew that conclusion, then that means that for those who've genuinely made mistakes, God will forgive. Amen? Yes. Number three, God will restore and rebuild broken marriages. God doesn't demand a divorce after one act of adultery. He permits it, but he doesn't demand it. Are you with me? I've seen countless lives changed after a marriage has been restored from adultery. I believe God can do it. It takes a strong man. It takes a strong woman of faith for God to do that and take something that was ugly and make it beautiful and a testimony to others. I've seen it in pastor lives that are friends of mine. I've seen God literally shake the nations when two people who had broken the covenant, been unfaithful, decide to really repent before God and ask him to put the broken pieces back together. I've seen God change the world through that renewal of covenant. Because of Jesus, there is grace. So if you're listening to me today and you failed, I'm not trying to beat you up. What I'm trying to say is there is grace because of Jesus Christ, that we all fall short of God's glory, that we've all looked and thought things that we shouldn't have thought, that we're all in the same boat when it comes to falling short of God's glory. But never, ever, ever take the wonderful gift of God's grace and pervert it for the sake of you to, for you to do whatever you want. Never take God's wonderful gift of grace and restoration and rub people's nose in it or rub God's face in the fact that you're not taking his laws seriously because it dishonors God. It takes two to make a covenant. It takes two to break a covenant. It takes teamwork and prayer to make a marriage work. You are to become one flesh. If you're pulling in opposite directions, you're not going to see God's best for your marriage. Forgiveness is a must. If you're a grudge holder, your marriage isn't going to work. If you're unwilling to forgive, then your marriage is going to get worse and worse and grow cold and distant if you will not forgive. The silent treatment is not of God. You need to get together and put Jesus in the center of your marriage. That's the only hope for our nation and our church is for Jesus to be at the center of our marriages. There is hope after the heartache of divorce. I know many of you have been divorced early in your lives. Some of you before you knew Christ. Some of you because of situations that were completely out of your control. And I'm not here to beat you up. I've broken covenants too, maybe not that one. But other covenants, we've all fallen short of God's glory. But what I'll challenge you to do, those of you that are remarried, is make sure you don't repeat past mistakes in the new covenant. Make sure God's at the center of your marriage. Make sure his church is the priority. Make sure you take time to love one another and come together and enjoy yourselves. Make sure you're faithful to the things that God loves and to your mate. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting unto the Lord. Ephesians on down says, submitting to one another in reverence and awe. The word submit means to rank under. It's not a demeaning word. It's the same word used when it said that our Savior Jesus submitted to the will of the Father when he went to the cross to die for us. So don't bow your neck up at me, woman, and tell me I'm not so submit. I'm talking it's a willing submission. You're willingly submitting because the man is putting so much godly love on you, you can't help but to submit. And if one's not doing their part, the other's not going to do their part. Man, if you ain't loving, she ain't submitting. It's a mutual submission that happens in conjunction with the other. You're both loving, you're both serving, because you have a shared destiny. Why do you think God puts you in a covenant with that person? 
Maybe the devil did. I hope not. But if God puts you in a covenant with the person you're married to, there's a purpose for it. My question to dig just one step deeper is, are you pursuing God's path for your life? I'm talking to married couples. Not husband, are you pursuing God's best for you? Not wife, are you doing what God wants you to do? Are you doing what God has called you to do together? Somebody just wave your hand let me know you hadn't passed out. Amen. I know it's deep in here, but this is the text that we had today. You're supposed to be advancing God's kingdom together, husband and wife. Let me tell you, we got some weak, wimpy men in this country. They don't come to church. They don't pray with their family. They don't serve God. They don't know how to get in a secret place and cry out to God. They don't pray for their wives. And we got women that come to this church by themselves and are some of the greatest, godliest women in the world. And the husband's at home making these women come by themselves to church. You ought to be ashamed. And you need Jesus. And that's what Malachi was speaking to. They weren't faithful to church. They weren't faithful to give. They weren't bringing a sacrifice of praise into the temple. They were going through the religious routine in their marriages, in their Christian walk, everything. And God was about to go silent 400 years and bring a curse because of it. I don't know about you, but I don't want God to go silent in my life. I don't want God to go silent in my marriage. I don't want God to go silent in this church or in this city. We need a restoration and a reunion. Jehovah had to divorce Israel. Speaks of that in Isaiah 50. So there is divorce in the Bible. There are things that happen that we're all ashamed of that brings about divorce. But what do we do? when that covenant has been broken? Well, we find our way to the altar and we sacrifice our own flesh and our own lives and our own issues to be right with God. We ask God to forgive us. We plead the blood of Jesus. We bring a sacrifice to the altar and say, God, forgive us. We want to come back together as one. You get the help you need. You, you make your marriage a priority. Listen, we have so many priorities. And for many of us, marriage is not even in the top five. Our hobbies are ahead of it. Our work is ahead of it. God wants us to put a focus on our marriage. To make sure it's strong. Make sure the devil can't find a foothold to destroy our marriages. What about ministry? Can y'all give me six more minutes? Y'all keep playing though, I like it. Can y'all give me six more minutes? Because I want to address this today because next week we're moving on in this series with October Bash and then the following week. What does God say about pastors that get divorced or deacons? You, you've heard of that in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3, read it when you get home. I'm just going to read a little bit of it. This is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. Religious people, that word doesn't mean perfect. Somebody amen me here. That word doesn't mean perfect, it means above reproach. The husband of one wife, then it lists some other characteristics. It also says, if you fast forward to verse 12, I said read it when you get home. Speaking of deacons, let deacons be the husbands of one wife. Now, for years we've been criticized because many of our leaders, some of our best faithful servants have had a divorce in their past. The Baptist people have hit us hard over that over the years. The phrase husband of one wife in this particular text in the Greek language means this. It means a person committed to one woman. A person committed to one woman. 
It does not mean a perfect person that's never had a divorce in their past. It literally means in the Greek, a one woman man. Are you with me? That's what it means. It, it spoke to polygamy, which was not an issue in Paul and Timothy's day, not a major one, a small one, but it was an issue during the law of Moses. So what this means is, look, you can't have 14 different wives at once and be a deacon or a bishop. How could you handle that many anyways? Lord, help us. It also means that a person in leadership in the church must be loyal to their spouse. Is everybody good with that? It's not religious because Jesus said, if you look on somebody, it's the same as doing it. So that means none of us are qualified. Amen? But we are all qualified because of the blood of Jesus. Amen? Not because we have a perfect past. Stand on your feet today. As I said, I believe the keys to a marriage, what begins as a connection, transitions to a shared covenant and leads to a shared destiny. And the key to a marriage is not love, it is commitment. Amen? The key to a great church is commitment. The key to a marriage is commitment. The key to friendship is commitment. The key to walking with God and discipleship is commitment. Amen? So today what I wanna do, we're gonna open the altars for prayer. Maybe you're struggling in your marriage or know someone that is. Maybe you need to be saved. Maybe you don't understand covenant because you've never said, Dear Lord Jesus, I need you in my life. By all means, don't get married if you don't know Jesus. And so today, if you need Jesus, we want you to come. We'll lead you to Christ. We'll baptize you. But some of you, maybe you need a renewal or a restoration in the area of commitment. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your faithfulness to the local church. Listen, next week we're having an October bash. Our staff has worked extremely hard for over a year on this. But it won't work if you don't invite people. The festivities start at 9 and go to 12. It's going to be fun. It's not that much of a sacrifice for you to invite people and bring them here and simply have fun. We're feeding you. We're having fun. Jamie Regal is one of the most dynamic evangelists and comedians I've ever heard. My dad and I used to travel to hear him and when we were teens. He's a friend of mine. If you want someone to be saved in your life and you're scared to talk to them about it, I promise you, my friend, if you'll bring them here for October Bash, they're going to get saved. They're going to hear the gospel in such a way and the Spirit's going to move. Isn't that what we exist for? So I need you, I challenge you to be faithful to that. Lift your hands up all over this place. Father God, we repent for where we've fallen short as husbands and wives. Lord, we repent today and ask for your forgiveness for where we've fallen short. As friends of yours and children of yours, forgive us, Father, when we've looked on someone with lust, when we've acted on our flesh, when we've forsaken the house of the Lord and forsaken the covenant of marriage. Forgive us, Father. We need your blood. We need your mercy. We plead for it. We don't take your grace for granted. But Lord, we're believing that you're gonna do a new thing, that this church is going to have godly marriages, godly covenants, people of faith, consistent and committed to your work for this house. Lord, send people who are hurting from the north, south, the east, and the west. Send marriages to us that are broken and we'll help put them back together. We will teach transgressors your ways, Father. If you will trust us with your sheep and the broken and the hurting and those who have made mistakes. Lord, may we not be religious. May we simply be real with those who need a touch from you. And may healing permeate the atmosphere today as you heal marriages and heal hearts and lead people 
into your kingdom. In Jesus' name, we call this done. Amen.